And ye fathers, I will appeal to you that are white. Have you any regard for your wives and children, for those delicate sons and daughters? Would you like to see them slain and lain in heaps, and their bodies devoured by the vultures and wild beasts of prey, and their bones bleaching in the sun and air till they molder away or were covered by the falling leaves of the forest and not resist? No, your hearts would break with grief. Here at Revolutionary Spaces, it's our mission to bring people together, to explore our nation's struggle, to create and sustain a free, a free society as evoked by the two national treasures that we care for, the old state house and old South meeting house. The work that began in these spaces during the nation's founding remains unfinished. And we believe that these witness sites have a vital role to play as gathering places where our diverse communities can come together and dialogue around the questions shaped here 250 years ago. Who speaks for me? What is my recourse if my needs or those of my, of my community are overlooked or ignored? What do we mean when we say, we the people? 2023 marks the 250th anniversary of the Boston Tea Party. And much of our work this year is devoted to commemorating that event and exploring its complex legacies. Tonight's program is central to that work because it challenges us. As the Pequot minister, William Apes, challenged his 19th century listeners to consider that the nation's founding was a process not only of creation, but also of conquest. Apes centered his narrative on the struggle of New England's Native American communities to retain their independence 100 years before 1776. Tonight, we will center Apes' voice, read his words, and consider together what they tell us about the history of Dawnland about who we are and about who we want to be. I want to be sure to thank Marty Blatt, a Professor Emeritus of Public History at Northeastern University for his contribution to the creation and planning of this program. Without his efforts, we would not be here tonight. Please, let's thank him. I also want to recognize our partners, the Northeastern University Humanities Center and the Institute for New England Native American Studies at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. And finally, I want to thank the following funders for their generous support of this program, the New England Humanities Consortium, Mass Humanities, and the Lowell Institute. Thank you. Now, if you enjoy tonight's program and feel compelled to support revolutionary spa spaces and programs like this, I hope you'll consider becoming a member by giving a gift in any amount that's meaningful to you. You can find more information about membership and sign up for our newsletter at www.revolutionaryspaces.org. At this time, I pause uh, to acknowledge on behalf of Revolutionary Spaces that the sites we care for, Old South Meeting House and the Old State House, stand on the, on the occupied, still unceded homeland of the Massachusetts tribe. We honor and respect the many Native peoples who are connected to this place, past, present, and future, including the Nipmuc, Massachusetts, and Wampanoag peoples, as well as many other communities represented here tonight. Revolutionary Spaces supports our Native neighbors and is committed to understanding and dismantling the destructive legacies of settler colonialism that are embodied in the histories of our buildings. And now, it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's moderator, Cedric. Dr. Woods, is a citizen of the Lumbee tribe of North Carolina 
and has served since 2009 as the director of the Institute for New England Native American Studies at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. He holds a PhD in anthropology from the University of Connecticut and is currently working on a range of projects with the tribes, with tribes in the area of tribal government uh, capacity building. Indian education, economic development, and chronic disease prevention. He previously served in a variety of capacities for the, Ma uh, for the Mashantucket Pequot Tribal Nation and as a consultant for the National Museum of the American Indian, the Halawa Sapani Indian Tribe of North Carolina, and the Mashantucket Pequot Museum and Research Center. I hope I got all of those correct. At this time, please let us uh, bring to the stage Dr. Woods. Thank you all so much. It's uh, definitely an honor to be here in this place and honoring a person I very much consider one of my heroes who I knew nothing about as a Lumbee growing up in North Carolina but learned a whole lot about living within initially Pequot homelands and engaging and interacting with many of the other indigenous communities impacted directly by the Reverend William Apes and his work. The program this evening is something different from what I normally do, standard, relatively dry academic panels. Uh, you are very fortunate, I am very fortunate uh, to be joined by panelist Elizabeth Solomon, uh, council person from the Massachusetts tribe at Ponkapog. Uh, I'll be introducing my colleague Drew Lopenzina in a minute, and we have five amazing readers here from D different native communities with their own experiences and their own passion for this topic here in this place and time. So we're going to have our readers who I will introduce, they'll come up, they'll read their session, and then we're going to do a facilitated discussion by myself uh, and for about five minutes and then we'll move into the next reader which I will introduce and they will present the next section of this powerful eulogy for King Philip by the Reverend William Apes. At the very end of the panel, we will have 20 minutes dedicated to question and answer from the audience, which I will also moderate. So that's how we're gonna do it. And again, the goal here is to create a space where we honor our revered ancestor, Reverend Apes, and also recognize the relevance of his work today in 2023 because it continues. Ask any Native people, person in this room and they will tell you that many of the topics he addressed then are still pertinent now. It is my honor to introduce my dear colleague, Professor Drew Lopanzina, a professor of early American and Native American literatures at Old Dominion University. His work looks at the intersections where settler colonial and indigenous writings meet often in ways that resist popular notions of how Native Americans engage with literacy. He is interested in formations of race and how race and culture are memorialized in public spaces. He is the author of three books, Red Ink, Native Americans Picking Up the Pen in the Colonial Period, The Rutledge Introduction to Native American Literature, and Through an Indian's Looking Glass, a cultural biog biography of William Apes Pequot. He is currently working on a critical edition of William Ape's 1829 memoir, A Son of the Forest, which is due to come out with Broadway Press in winter 2024. And maybe at that point in time, we can do another program, Drew. Thank you so much, Cedric. I really appreciate the introduction. It's Broadview Press, by the way. That, that was probably my typo. I just, I went the Broadway direction. So I'm gonna begin, first of all, it's just, it's a very, it's, it's a real honor to be here tonight. I'm, I'm grateful to be here. Um, I think this is an amazing event. Um, I'm gonna begin by asking you all a question. 
And if the answer is yes, please just raise your hand. So how many of you have heard of Frederick Douglass? Everybody, right? Now, how many of you before this evening's event have heard of William Apis? All right, well, that's a pretty good number, um, unless some of you are faking it. Uh, I've actually, I, I've gone around the country, universities, um, historical societies, and I've talked about APIS, and I ask that question wherever I go, and usually what I get is, is one hand goes up, maybe two, quite often none, um, which begs the question, well, why did you come to the talk? But I'm grateful that they did, because it's my mission to really bring William APIS to the American public, uh, to make him understand him in, in the ways that I've tried to understand him, and to make him the kind of household name that Frederick Douglass is, because I, I believe he deserves that kind of recognition. I think he's that important, particularly to Native communities. So I'm really grateful. Um, I just want to say grateful once again to, to Marty Blatt for bringing this thing together. Um, it's really, I think this is just an amazing event, and, and so thrilled to be in this particular space. So I've been asked to give a brief introduction on King Philip's War, on who William Apis was, and on the eulogy itself. I've been given about 10 minutes to do this. I could write books on all of these topics, and I've already killed two minutes. So let me do this as quickly as I can. First of all, King Philip's War, or Metacom's War, um, took place between 1675 and 1678. It's often perhaps hyperbolically described as the most bloodiest war in U.S. history or in American history. Uh, it, it gets that reputation because presumably a greater percentage of the population of people uh, died in that war than in any other war. Um, and, and most of those deaths were in fact Native American deaths. When we read conventional histories of King Philip's War, uh, the reasons for the war are usually stated in a particular way. Um, we're told that this was a clash of cultures, that these two civilizations couldn't live and share the same space together. They were, they were uh, incompatible with one another. This, of course, ignores the fact that they had been living peacefully side by side as neighbors, as trading partners for 50 years at this point. Um, since the Mayflower Pilgrims first arrived in Massachusetts right up until the 1670s when King Philip's War takes place. Some of the causes that are often given for the war, and more specifically, were colonial encroachments on native lands as, as second and third waves of pilgrims, if you will, um, began coming here and, and, and spreading out over the territory. Um, there were different ways of using the land, and uh, colonial uh, cattle would get into native cornfields, and the pigs would dig up their, their clam, um, uh, clam banks, and this made it difficult for, for native people here. And then there was the mysterious death of Wamsuda. Wamsuda was, uh, was King Philip or Metacom's brother. Both of them were sons of Massasoit who was the Wampanoag sachem at the time. And we all know who he is uh, through Thanksgiving pageants. And he, he's, he is the, the leader of the Wampanoag who first greeted the pilgrims when they came here and brokered the peace treaty that had lasted for 50 years until his death. Once he died, Wamsuda took over um, as the leader of the Wampanoag community, and specifically the Poconocket Wampanoag. Uh, but Wamsuda, uh, the, the colonists decided maybe it was time to rethink this, this peace treaty that had lasted for so long, and they um, took Wamsuda into custody, and they uh, decided that they would disarm him and force him to declare allegiance to the King of England. This is already a rather inhospitable way of treating uh, the new leader of the Wampanoag at this point. But to make things worse, when Wamsuda left uh, on his return home, he simply dropped dead. Um, people in the indigenous community believed he had been poisoned. Historians simply refer to this as a mystery. One other event that led to King Philip's War was the death of John Sassamon. John Sassamon was a praying Indian. He had uh, been one of the natives who had been schooled at Harvard. Um, he had worked on what was known as the Eliot or Indian Bible at the time. It's the first Bible to be published in uh, North America that was uh, written in the Algonquian language. And 
when he was murdered, the colonists, or when he died, he died in an ice fishing accident, but his, the colonists decided that they would view this as a murder case. And they tried three of King Philip's or Medicom's counselors, and they were uh, decided to be guilty, and they were hung for these offenses. All of this seemed pretty uh, uh, legitimate to colonial uh, people at the time and to historians um, traditionally. But, and, and so King Philip has often been portrayed as somebody who was um, haughty, brooding, insolent. These are the words that are often used to describe him even in the history books. Somebody who, who took these perceived slights and used them as a reason to attack the English. And so in June of 1675, the native people attacked the town of Swansea. And this was considered to be a surprise attack on a Sunday as the pilgrims were leaving their church service. And King Philip's War began at this point. Now, as Will, William Apis will tell us, this was in fact no savage war of surprise as many suppose. And when we listen to William Apis's words, we're going to see how he makes a case for the fact that the colonists had courted war with the natives all along. Um, they didn't just encroach on native territories, they took, they claimed those territories, they were actually granted these tracts of lands before they ever even signed the deeds that now show up in our archives. They uh, forced native people to swear allegiance to the King of England, they um, imposed Christianity on native communities. And when Philip took over from Wamsuda in 1671, he was also called to a council, a presumably peaceful council, and he too was forced to disarm at this meeting and to sign a proclamation that said that he swore allegiance to the King of England and, uh, and, and to Christianity. These were all events that were done under great and unrelenting pressure. Um, lands were taken, food sources were ravaged, native people were harassed and unjustly treated. And these were the events that led to the war itself. And the war uh, lasted in this area for about a year, it continued to go on for two more years in Abenaki territory. At the beginning, the uh, natives had a great deal of success, and they managed to drive many of the English settlers out of their most western towns and frontier settlements and push them north towards Boston. But then spring came around, and I believe that for a lot of native people, this was a time to go back to your community, to plant your fields once again. Native people were not uh, traditionally accustomed to prosecuting war in this long, sustained manner over years and years. And when they decided it was time to go home, that's when the English regathered themselves and, and pushed King Philip and his troops um, into submission and ultimately ended the war. Um, so we'll see how William Apis speaks about these events. When, William a when uh, King Philip um, was finally uh, assassinated, if you will, uh, we find out that his son and his wife were sold into slavery. This is a moment of the eulogy that uh, William Apis speaks perhaps most passionately about. We will learn how other Wampanoag, Narragansett, Nipmuc, Pocasset, and other people that King Philip or Medicom had pulled together as a united force uh, to contest the colonists with, were also harassed, hunted down, killed. Heads were placed on spikes and put in, uh, on the gates of the colony of Plymouth. Uh, many were sold into slavery or kept as bond servants in English homes. And I just wanna say that in this space right here, so this space, um, the meeting house that was first established here in 1669, and then this space built in 1729, the congregants who came here um, still held this, this war in their memory. This was still part of their living memory um, for many people. And in their history, this is the way that Philip was described. I'm just going to read a short passage from William Hubbard, who was the historian of the Puritans at the time. And this is how they understood uh, King Philip or Medicom in this space at this time. He said, Philip like a savage wild beast, having been hunted by the English forces through the woods above a hundred miles backward and forward, at last was driven to his own den. 
which proved but a prison to keep him fast till the messengers of death came by divine permission to execute vengeance upon him. And so we need to understand that Philip and his, and his uh, native um, community were considered like wild animals who were meant to be hunted down and executed uh, by divine permission. Now, a hundred years later, those attitudes right here in this congregation probably would have changed quite a bit. Um, by the time we get to the 1830s, there was an understanding that the native threat in the Northeast was now vanquished, and that was not a concern of the dominant community here. And the view that they began to take of people like King Philip and other native uh, leaders of this time was that they were noble savages. This became the, the sort of language of the day from, from books like uh, James Fenimore Cooper's The Last of the Mohicans, uh, writings by Washington Irving and others. Philip was romanticized as one who, although perhaps wronged, um, had to acknowledge to himself that the time of the red man had come to a close and that those people must disappear into the setting sun. And this was the kind of language that was being used, the noble savage, the romanticized native. And, and so that was what, what most people would have thought about of native people in this time in the 1830s. But then along came William Apis. William Apis was a Pequot native, he was an author, he was an activist, and he was an ordained Methodist minister. He was self-educated, he had an incredibly difficult childhood and upbringing, which he tells us about in his 1829 book, um, A Son of the Forest. He wrote five books in his lifetime between 1829 and 1836. And he is really the first native person to write and publish these types of book-length narratives that served not only to tell his life stories, but as, as arguments of advocacy for Native people and for Native rights. So I just want to say Apis is special. Um, there was nothing else like him at this time. Um, he is a passionate, eloquent voice for justice um, in the 1830s. And his eulogy on King Philip, which was written in 1836, was first delivered here in Boston at the Odeon Theater, which I'm told would have been uh, roughly uh, 500 yards around the corner from here. So when we hear his words today, we are thinking about the echoes of that first delivery of, of this um, address, um, which was given so many years ago. Apis certainly understood that Philip Ermeticon was not a noble savage. He understood that he was uh, not the last of his race. Apis, in fact, himself had been adopted by the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe at this time and lived amongst them. But he did understand Philip to be a leader, a diplomat. He understood him to be a husband, a father, and a brilliant tactician in war, but also ostensibly a man of peace. So when we hear Apis's words today, I want you to listen for the way that he essentially flips the script as it has been written up to the point of his life. Um, he uses the colonists' own words, their own historical records, to demonstrate that they, in fact, were the aggressors um, in King Philip's War and in every other event that followed, that the colonists were, in fact, the savages, if you will. Um, Apis offers an historical defense of Philip in his eulogy, but it's also something more than that. It's a critique of settler colonial, colonialism as it stands. Um, and we really have to appreciate, I think, the courage it must have taken in 1836 to stand before all white audiences, to speak these words and to offer this critique, the audacity, um, the will of William Apis to, to get up and say these things. Um, he basically tells us that when we honor the Pilgrim Fathers, when we give speeches and build monuments and consecrate uh, public spaces like Plymouth Rock, or in fact, like this space that we're occupying right now, that when we honor those words and those deeds, that we are in fact complicit in their acts of violence as well. And that was a difficult message to deliver 
uh, now. It certainly was a difficult message to deliver in 1836. Um, he recognized that there was something in the very language of settler colonial history, um, the way it was told, the way it was spoken, that uh, showed that, that the racial bias was systemic. And so I want to suggest that Apis was, in fact, our very first practitioner of critical race theory. Um, and so I appreciate you all being here. As one ad in 1836 for one of his addresses said in the newspapers, come listen to what the Indian has to say. Um, this is the first time these words will be spoken, I think, in this perform performative way in the city of Boston in 187 years. So thank you all for coming. Thank you, Drew. I'm going to ask my fellow panelist, Elizabeth Solomon, uh, a dear friend and enrolled member of the Massachusetts tribe at Ponkapog uh, to join us here uh, as we prepare for our first reader. Uh, my dear friend Elizabeth speaks frequently about local indigenous issues and has a long-standing commitment to human rights, diversity, inclusion, and community building. She brings both to her paid and volunteer work, both of which are voluminous. <laughs> She currently works as the Director of Administration in the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and has more than three decades of public health experience working in both university and community-based settings. She also serves on multi multiple advisory and management boards. Uh, she recently completed a master's degree in museum studies and she has a commitment to work with native communities and others that are currently underrepresented in museum exhibits and public history programs to assist them with bringing their voices and stories to the forefront. And it's hard to believe that it was three years ago when we first had dinner and spoke about this event. But here we are today. It has happened. Uh, and with that, it is also my great honor to introduce a dear friend of mine, our first reader, Robert Peters, a Mashpee Wampanoag tribal citizen, artist, writer, keeper of oral tradition, and one of my neighbors in Mattapan, Robert Peters. I do not arise to spread before you the fame of a noted warrior whose natural abilities shone like those of the great and mighty Philip of Greece or of Alexander the Great or like those of Washington whose virtues and patriotism are engraven on the hearts of my audience. Neither do I approve of war being the best method of bowing to the hotly tyrant man and civilizing the world. No. Far from me be such a thought. But it is to bring you beings made by the God of nature and in whose hearts and heads he has planted sympathies that shall live forever in the memory of the world. As the immortal Washington lives endeared and engriven on the hearts of every white in America, never to be forgotten in time, even such is the immortal Philip honored the rude yet all-accomplished son of the forest that died a martyr to his cause, though unsuccessful, yet as glorious as the American Revolution. Where then shall we place the hero of the wilderness? The first inquiry is, who is Philip? He was the descendant of Massasoit, one of the most celebrated chiefs 
in the known world for peace and universal benevolence towards all men. His country extensive, his men numerous, so as the wilderness was enli enlivened by them, say a thousand to one over white men, and they also sick and feeble. Where, where then shall we find one nation submitting so tamely to another with such a host at their command? For injuries of much less magnitude have the people called Christians slain their brethren till they could sing like Samson with the jawbone of an ass. We have slain our thousands and lain them in heaps. It will be well for us to lay those deeds and deparations committed by whites upon Indians before the civilized world, and then they can judge for themselves. On December 1620, the pilgrims landed at Plymouth, and without asking liberty from anyone, they possessed themselves a portion of the country and built themselves houses and then made a treaty and commanded them to accede to it. This, if done now, would be called an insult, and every white man would be called to go out and act their part, the patriot, to defend their country's rights. And if every intruder were butchered, it would be sung upon every hilltop in the Union that victory and patriotism was the order of the day. And yet, the Indians, though many were dissatisfied, without the shedding of blood or imprisoning anyone, bore it. And yet, their for their kindness and resignation towards whites, they were called savages and made by God on purpose for them to destroy. We might say God understood his work better than this, but to proceed, it pre it appears that a treaty was made by pilgrims and Indians, which treaty was kept during 40 years. The young chief during this time was showing pilgrims how to live in their country and find support for their wives and little ones. And for all this, they were, they were receiving the applause of being savages. The history of New England writers say that our tribes were large and respectable, but let us trace them for a few moments. How have they been destroyed? Is it by fair means? No. How then? By hypocritical proceedings, by being duped and flattered? flattered by informing the Indian that their God was going to speak to them and then place them before the cannon's mouth in a line and then put a match to it and kill thousands of them by rum and powder and ball together with all the diseases such as smallpox and every other disease imaginable and in this way swept off thousands and tens of thousands. And who is to account for the destruction upon innocent families and helpless children? It was said by some of the New England writers that living babies were found at the breasts of their dead mothers. And to think too, these, these, these diseases were carried among them on purpose to destroy them. Let the children of the pilgrims blush, while the son of the forest drops a tear and groans over the fate of his murdered and departed fathers. He would say to the sons of the pilgrims, let the day be dark, the 22nd of December, 1622. Let it, be, let it be forgotten in your celebration, in your speeches, and by burying the rock that your fathers first put their foot upon. For be it remembered, although the gospel is said to be glad tidings to all people, 
Yet we poor Indians never have found those who brought it as messengers of mercy, but counterwise. We say, therefore, let every man of color wrap himself in mourning for the 22nd of December and the 4th of July are days of mourning and not joy. Let them rather fast and pray to the great spirit, the Indian's God, who deals out mercy to his red children and not destruction. O oh, Christians, can you answer for those beings that have been destroyed by your hostilities? Beings, too, that lie endeared to, to God as yourselves. And will you presume to say that you are executing the judgments of God by doing so? As it is certain that every time they celebrate the day of the pilgrims that they do. Although in words they deny it, yet in the works they approve of the inequities of their fathers and the seed of inequity and prejudice was sown in that day, so it still remains. And there is a deep-rooted popular opinion in the hearts of many that Indians were made on purpose for destruction, to be driven out by white Christians, and that, and that they take their places, and that God had decreed it from all eternity. Why, my brethren, the poor missionaries want money to go out and convert poor heathen, as if God could not convert them where they were, but must first drive them out. If God wants the red man converted, we should think he could do so <clears throat> in one place as well as another. But I must say, and I shall say, that the missionaries have injured us more than they have done us good by degrading us as people in breaking up our governments and leaving us without suffrages, whatever, or a legal right among men. Oh, what a cursed doctrine this is. It most certainly is not fit to civilize men much more to save their souls. And we poor Indians want no such missionaries around us. But I would suggest one thing, and that is for the, and that is let the ministers use the colored people they have already found around them as like human beings before they go out and convert anymore. <clears throat> and let them show it in their churches, and let them proclaim it on the house, upon housetops. And I would say to the benevolent, withhold your hard earnings from them unless they do do it, until they can stop laying their own wickedness to God, which is blasphemy. Thank you, Robert. I'll now pose a couple of directed questions to our esteemed panel and reader as a way to spark some additional conversation and reflection among this group before we move on to our next speaker. How would you say apes contrast the teachings of Christianity with the actions and attitudes of the pilgrims towards native peoples? Sure. How, how does apes contrast the teachings of Christianity with the actions and attitudes of the pilgrims and other English towards native peoples? So I, I think there's quite a bit of irony there in, in um, how he talks about Christianity and in terms of how, what Christianity purports to believe and what the pilgrims were saying they were bringing to native peoples, but then when you look at the actions that were actually taken 
that they are very, um, as, as the, the end the last right. word was blasphemy. It's blasphemy. So, so really kind of um, the whole idea that um, you would be bringing something to Native peoples um, that's going to make their lives better, but in fact it's actually making it worse. So I think that that's one, one, one way to kind of think about that. Thank you, Elizabeth. Drew? Yeah. Um, first, I just want to thank Rob for such a powerful reading of it because, you know, I've never really gotten to hear this read out loud before, and, and that was, it, it's just a whole different experience. But one of the things that, you know, you, it needs a little historical perspective, too, because he's, he's clearly calling out the Puritans and, and those, you know, those early settlers who were pushing Christianity on Native people. Um, but he's also speaking to his own times, and that comes through as well, um, because the Cherokee removal is going on. The Indian uh, 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 Removal Act has been passed by Congress at this point. And when he's saying, you know, why do Native people have to be moved somewhere else to learn Christianity? Why can't they learn it right where they are? And that's what I'd like to see. And, and, and like, until you learn how to teach us, you know, where we are, don't even bother trying. And, and so he's, he's calling out the hypocrisy of, of, you know, across a period of, of a couple hundred years. And, and I think it's important to understand those contexts are being reflected in his work as well. I'm glad you... Um made that reference to the Removal Act because I didn't, I thought it would pertain to right here and now, but, you know, putting it in that context really makes that make a whole lot more sense. Thank you all. Another question. What do the comparisons of George Washington or early heroes of the Republican Medicom say about myth-making, if you will? supposedly was fighting for um, in terms of the liberty, freedom, and the idea that there could be another person that you could put forward with similar um, ideals and similar ideas that, that really kind of thinks about like, okay, how, how are we looking at our myths? What do our myths really mean? And how can we, maybe it's a way of kind of trying to examine those, um, that, that we kind of are looking at um, something from the standpoint of the colonists and settlers and what the goals and values are there and that there are similar values, goals, and, and aspirations among Native peoples that are totally not either acknowledged or understood. Thank you. Maybe I would just add to that. Um, I, I think that's absolutely right. And I just think, I, I mentioned, you know, the audacity of William Apis, and it's also his use of uh, irony, right? But just the audacity to say, like, yeah, I know about Washington and, and Napoleon or whoever else he talks about, Alexander the Great. Why not call King Philip, like, the greatest person who ever lived? And it's like, you know, he, he says in, in that particular segment, he, he calls out the, he says, let the day be dark, the 4th of July and the day the, the pilgrims first landed. You know, those days mean nothing to us. And the people who are associated with those, with those days and those celebrations, they did nothing for Native people. Why should we celebrate them? I think King Philip, Medicom, is the greatest person who ever lived. Um, and so he's, he's, he's willing to just throw that out there. Um, and it's part of... It, it, I, I do think it, it's, I think it's sincere, but I also think he understands how he's, he's, he's turning the tables and, and using irony in a certain way to, to make a suggestion that won't be readily accepted by the white audiences that he's speaking to, so. Well, I think um, the consciousness of people now and how they're looking at the world and they're wrestling with 
cancel culture and they're wrestling with, you know, bringing out the truth and they're, they're fighting with uh, their own demons. Um, I think it's important to realize that this, th these are growing pains that we need to go through now and we, why we need to listen to something like this. And um, William Apis's uh, uh, eulogy. Um, he, much of what he says, most of what he says is still prevalent today. And these things are still happening and the genocide is still taking place in, in other ways. Um, and you really did have people come in and take our country and take our place and take our leadership and take our history and replace it with their own. Um, but now today, I think more people realize that they're colonists than did 10, 15 years ago. Because they thought, like, well, this is America. It's always been like this. And George Washington was the first president. And I know how to sing Yankee Doodle Dandy. Um, and I think today in the world, more Americans feel more like this is a colony than they did because of the education and being told the truth about how all of this came about. Thank you so much. Thanks again, Robert. Our next reader will be Tara Mays. Tara is the Communications Manager for Children's Media and Education, GBH Kids, where she creates and implements communications campaigns and strategies develops thought leadership opportunities, partnerships and events while connecting the key messages of GBH kids to our wider audiences. She's also an alum of the University of Massachusetts Boston, where she received a master's in public history as well as Boston College with a bachelor's in history. Tara is a descendant of the Nipmuc Nation. Tara. It is a matter of uncertainty about Philip's age, but his birthplace was at Mount Hope, Rhode Island, where Massasoit, his father, lived till 1656 and died, and also his brother Alexander by the governors ill-treating him. After which, the kingdom fell into the hands of Philip, the greatest man that ever lived upon the American shores. When he came into office, it appears that he knew there was great responsibility resting upon himself and country, that it was likely to be ruined by those rude intruders around him, though he appears friendly and is willing to sell them lands for almost nothing. Who stood up in those days and since to plead Indian rights? Was it the friend of the Indian? No. It was his enemies who rose, his enemies to judge and pass sentence. Philip could no longer restrain his young men, who, upon the 24th of June, 1675, provoked the people of Swansea by killing their cattle and other injuries, which was a signal to commence the war. It was upon a fast day, too, and as the people were returning from church, they were fired upon by the Indians, when several of them were killed. It is not supposed that Philip directed this attack, but opposed to it. Though it is not doubted that he meant to be revenged upon his enemies, for during some time he had been cementing his countrymen together, as it appears that he had sent to all of the disaffected tribes, who also had watched the movements of the corners from the New World and were as dissatisfied as Philip himself was with their proceedings. At this council, it appears that Philip made the following speech to his chiefs, counselors, and warriors. Brothers, you see this vast country before us, which the great spirit gave to our fathers and us. You see the buffalo and deer that now are our support. Brothers, you see these little ones, our wives and children, who are looking to us for food and raiment. And you now see the foe before you that have grown insolent and bold, that all our ancient customs are disregarded, the treaties made by our fathers and us are broken, and all of us insulted, our council fires disregarded, and all the ancient customs of our fathers 
our brothers murdered before our eyes, and their spirits cry to us for revenge. Brothers, these people from the unknown worlds will cut down our groves, spoil our hunting and planting grounds, and drive us and our children from the graves of our fathers and our council fires and enslave our women and children. This famous speech of Philip was calculated to arouse them to arms, to do the best they could in protecting and defending their rights. The blow had now been struck, the die was cast, and nothing but blood and carnage was before them. And we find Philip as active as the wind, as dexterous as a giant, firm in the pillows of heaven, and fierce as a lion, the powerful foe to contend with indeed, and as swift as an eagle, gathering together his forces to prepare them for battle. And as it would swell our dress to full to mention all the tribes in Philip's train of warriors, suffice it to say, that from six to seven were with him at different times. It must be recollected that this war was legally declared by Philip so that the colonies had a fair warning. It was no savage war of surprise, as supposed, but one sorely provoked by the pilgrims themselves. But when Philip and his men fought as they were accustomed to do and according to their mode of war, it was more than what could be expected. But we hear no particular acts of cruelty commit, committed by Philip during the siege. But we find more manly nobility in him than we do in all the head pilgrims put together. And we shall see during this quarrel between them. And now, town after town fell before them. The pilgrims with their forces were marching ever in one direction, while Philip and his forces were marching in another, burning all before them, until Middleborough, Taunton, and Dartmouth were laid in ruins and forsaken by its inhabitants. The Philips determined to break down Philip's power, if possible, with the Narragansetts. Thus they raised an army of 1,500 strong to go against them and destroy them. Proceeding their march, Philip had made all arrangements for the winter and had fortified himself upon a small island near South Kingston, Rhode Island. Here, he intended to pass the winter with his warriors and their wives and children. About 500 Indian houses were erected of a superior kind, in which were deposited all their stores, tubs of corn, and other things piled up to great height, which rendered it bulletproof. It was supposed that 3,000 persons had taken up residence in it. I would remark that Indians took better care of themselves in those days than they have been able to since. Accordingly, on the 19th of December, after the pilgrims have been out in extreme cold for nearly one month, their provision being short and all the air full of snow, they had no other alternative than to attack Philip in the fort. There was but one point where it could have been entered or assailed with any success. And this was fortified much like a blockhouse, directly in front of the entrance, and also flankers to, cross, to cover a crossfire besides hide palisades, an immense hedge of fallen trees of nearly a rod in thickness. Thus surrounded by trees and water, there was but one place that the pilgrims could pass. Nevertheless, they made the attempt. Philip now had directed his men to fire, and every platoon of Indians swept every white man from the path one after another, until six captains, with a great many of the men, had fallen. In the meantime, one Captain Mosley, with some of his men, had somehow or other gotten into the fort in another way and surprised them, by which the pilgrims were enabled to capture the fort, at the same time setting fire to it, hewing down men, women, and children indiscriminately. Philip, however, was enabled to escape with many of his warriors. It is said at this battle, 80 whites were killed and 150 wounded, many of whom died of their wounds afterwards, not being able to dress them till they had marched 18 miles, also leaving many of their dead in the fort. It is said that 700 of the Narragansetts perished, the greater part of them being women and children. Thank you, Tara. Apes quotes King Philip's famous speech 
employed to arouse warriors to arms to defend their rights. What do you think his goal was in using this particular speech attributed to King Philip? Um, I guess I'll start. <laughs> um, I think when you think about who he's speaking to, and um, given the context of the history of what Philip was seen at that point, that he's clearly making almost like being uh, apes, being King uh, Medicom's greatest PR person, a claim as to why the war was just and kind of flipping the switch as to what we think the hero and the villain was in that story. Yeah, and I, I agree, and I also want to <clears throat> kind of go back again maybe to George Washington and really kind of think about the idea of a just war and who is acting in the best interest, interest of their people. Um, that there's really that, that contrasting, again, um, around this, but also the incredible brutality that took place in the, in the sense of you know, what we would consider war, war crimes now, and there were war crimes then, of really basically killing multiple non-combatants. -combat yeah, I'll just say, um, you know, these, these are words that were attributed to Philip, and, and so I think Apis wants to honor Philip by, by speaking those words out loud. There's not, we don't have a lot of uh, speeches to draw from that, that, that were attributed to, to Philip. But, but I, I do agree that this, it speaks to, you know, Philip emerges in this speech as somebody who um, is, is kind of predicting the kind of depredations that are going to be uh, committed against native people right up to Apis's own time and and so he's he's seen that speech speak to a vision of history that has in fact played out you know council fires have been put out and 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 kinship networks have been destroyed and and hunting grounds taken away and, and all those things that Philip predicted and and so uh, and 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 it speaks to again Philip as as this as a great leader um, who, who is standing against these types of depredations while, you know, as Elizabeth is pointing out, and, and I don't know how clear, you have to sort of know King Philip's War history, but uh, Apis during all this is referring to the, what's known as the Narragansett Fort Fight. And this is when, you know, the Narragansett had, had built this fort and there were, there were any 800 to a uh, couple thousand people living in it, mostly women and children, because the Narragansett had agreed to take on the, the Narragansett hadn't formally entered the war at this point, and they'd agreed to take on and shelter the women and children of the Wampanoag while they were in battle. And this was a, a form of hospitality that they had um, uh, given to the Wampanoag at this point. And so when the settlers came in and they, they burnt down that fort and they burnt everybody in it alive, um, it wasn't the first time they had done something like that, but uh, but you know the colonists estimate in the colonial reports it says like 700 to 800 people died. It could have easily have been more than that who were killed alive in that fire, and so that's what he's speaking to. And those are the types of depredations that are being stood against in, in Philip's speech. Thank you. What does mainstream history? tell us about who is cast as heroes and villains during this conflict between natives and English? Well, I think it's kind of, that's, I mean, it, I, I guess it's kind of an obvious answer in terms of that the heroes in our mythology are the colonists, are the people who went later in terms of um, fighting the revolution against the British, um, and that native peoples were seen as savage, um, as not necessarily civilized, um, potentially um, not having the same cultural, um, uh, it's not the value, but the, the same type of cultural 
um, what's the word, uprising or up, upholding that, that we have, that, that the, the, the English had and the people that, the white folks who, who came to this country and really kind of, um, kind of contrast that, you know, in terms of like what, what was happening within native spaces. And I found it really interesting that he talked about, you know, as, as you know, putting out the council fires and change and, and pulling, you know, basically um, tamping down the cultural issues that really that's kind of like, again, thinking about what is just about what Philip did and what native folks did and continue to do um, based on actually the idea that there's also, there's villainy, there's more villainy on one side than the other and it's the different, it's the different side than we expected. Um, so yeah, I mean, the, the, this is the whole, you know, he is flipping the script, so to speak, and the, the assumption, the, the colonists, you know, I read that passage from the historian William Hubbard a little earlier, and the assumption was that, that these atrocities were God-ordained, that, that God had said it was okay to kill these people, and that this land that God had given it to these chosen people as part of their covenant um, that they thought that they had with God. And so, and so to do all of these things were considered appropriate and, and from a colonial point of view. And, and, and of course, just the common denomination of Native people as savages. And so it, it's in the section where William Apis says, this was no savage war of surprise. We were not the savages here. King Philip had said what his um, intentions were. He gave that speech. He announced what was going to happen. Um, that, that we had been driven to war is what he's been saying, that we have no choice. And, and so it's the natives who are acting within the bounds of, of legitimate um, warfare, and it's the colonists who are, are acting in, in really unspeakable and savage ways and, and giving the credit to God for it. I think also if you think about it in the context that um, when he's speaking what we think as the United States was relatively new. So how dangerous it was to even think that the people who we had probably for about that time 100 years immoralized as being the best people to create this country and it was an experiment. Um, and to flip that myth on its heads and say, no, they created, they did horrible things in the pursuit of creating this country. I mean, we have a hard time thinking about that now um, when it comes to the founding father, what they call the founding fathers of this country. Um, so I think what he's doing is not only brave, but it's purposeful. And it's to make people think and to say that what you created as your manifest destiny or what you thought was God, God ordained came at the lives and costs of communities and people, and especially, I think, to his point, women and children. Thank you. Thanks again, Tara. Our next reader is Brittany Wally, a Nipmuc tribal member. Brittany's advocacy work has included represented, representing the Chibunagungamug Nipmuc and Hassanamisco Nipmuc. She served as a representative of the Hassanamisco Nipmuc during the work of the Special Commission on the Official Seal and Motto of the Commonwealth. She continues advocacy work as a public speaker, member of the Massachusetts Mascot Steering Committee, and as a weaver. Brittany. It appears that Philip treated his prisoners with a great deal more Christian-like spirit than the pilgrims did. Even Miss Rowlandson, although speaking with bitterness sometimes of the Indians, yet in her journal she speaks not a word against him. Philip even hires her to work for him, and he pays her for her work, and then invites her to dine with him and to smoke with him. And we have many testimonies that he was kind to his prisoners. And when the English wanted to redeem Philip's prisoners, they had the privilege. 
Now, did Governor Winthrop or any of those ancient divines use any of his men so? No. Was it known that they received any of their female captives into their houses and fed them? No. It cannot be found upon history. Were not the females completely safe and none of them were violated as they acknowledged themselves? But was it so when the Indian women fell into the hands of the pilgrims? No. Did the Indians get a chance to redeem their prisoners? No. But when they were taken, they were either compelled to turn traitors and join their enemies or be butchered on the spot. And this is the dishonest method that the famous Captain Church used in doing his great exploits, and in no other way could he ever gained one battle. It is with shame, I acknowledge, that I have to notice so much corruption of a people calling themselves Christians. If they were like my people, professing no purity at all, then their crimes would not appear to have such magnitude. But while they appear to be, by profession, more virtuous, their crimes still blacken. It makes them truly to appear to be like mountains, filled with smoke and thick darkness, covering them all around. But we have another dark and corrupt deed for the sons of pilgrims to look at, and that is the fight and capture of Philip's son and wife and many of his warriors, in which Philip lost about 130 men, killed and wounded. This was in August 1676. But the most horrid act was in taking Philip's son, about 10 years of age, and selling him to be a slave away from his father and mother. While I am writing, I can hardly restrain my feelings to think a people calling themselves Christians would conduct so scandalous, so outrageous, making themselves appear so despicable in the eyes of the Indians. And even now, in this audience, I doubt but there is men honorable enough to despise the conduct of those pretended Christians. And surely none but such as believe they did right will ever go and undertake to celebrate that day of their landing, the 22nd of December. Only look at it, then stop and pause. My fathers came here for liberty themselves, and then they must go and chain that mind, that image they profess to serve, not content to rob and cheat the poor ignorant Indians, but must take one of the king's sons and make a slave of him. Gentlemen and ladies, I blush at these tales. If you do not, especially when they profess to be a free and humane people, yes, they did. They took a part of my tribe and sold them to the Spaniards in Bermuda and many others. And then, on the Sabbath day, these people would gather themselves together and say that God is no respecter of persons. And there's no manner of doubt but that all my countrymen would have been enslaved if they had tamely submitted. He that will advocate slavery is worse than a beast. He is a being devoid of shame, and he has gathered around him the most corrupted, debasing principles in the world. And I care not whether he be a minister or any member in, of any church in the world. No, not accepting the headmen of the nation. And he that will not set his face against its corrupt principles is a coward and not worthy of being numbered among men and Christians. And conduct, too, that libels the laws of the country and the word of God that men profess to believe in. Philip's forces had now become very small, so many having been duped away by the whites and killed that it was now easy surrounding him. Therefore, upon the 12th of August, Captain Church surrounded the swamp where Philip and his men had encamped early in the morning before they had risen. When coming out of the swamp, he was fired upon by an Indian and killed dead upon the spot. Upon this news, the pilgrims gave three cheers and the church ordering his body to be pulled out of the mud while one of those tender-hearted Christians exclaims, what a dirty creature he looks like. And we also have church's speech upon that subject as follows. For as much as he has caused many a pilgrim to lie above ground, unburied, to rot. Not one of his bones shall be buried. With him fell five of his best and most trusty men, one the son of a chief who fired the first gun in the war. Captain Church now orders him to be cut up. 
Accordingly, he was quartered and hung up upon four trees, his head and one hand given to the Indian who shot him to carry about to show, at which sight so overjoyed the pilgrims that they would give him money for it, and in this way obtained a considerable sum after which his head was sent to Plymouth and exposed upon a gibbet for 20 years, and his hand to Boston, where it was exhibited in savage triumph and his mangled body denied a resting place in the tomb. I do not hesitate to say that through the prayers, preaching, and examples of those pretended pious has been the foundation of all the slavery and degradation in the American colonies towards colored people. Experience has taught me that this has been a most sorry and wretched doctrine to us poor, ignorant Indians. Thank you. Thank you, Brittany. Apis describes the shooting of Philip and subsequent dismemberment of his body with his head displayed in Plymouth and his hand in Boston exhibited in savage triumph. Why do you think he chose this graphic description of violence and desecration? First, I want to kind of um, Thank you, Brittany, for, for reading that. Um, it's a difficult thing to read. Um, it's a difficult thing to hear. Um, that's the point. Really kind of thinking about um, what it would mean to, one, kill someone quarter them, give part of his body as trophies, and then display publicly um, parts of the body, really, again, illustrates the incredible savagery that was promulgated on Native peoples. And I think it's very telling that he also puts this in the context of Christianity, in that there's this profession of being charitable and um, loving and embracing others that did not extend to Native people. Um, and I think that what's really touching about that is that there's the idea that Christianity would save Native people. a small detail to add um, because I do think that it highlights the hypocrisy of what was going on. A little bit higher. I was worried the other microphone would be too tall for me. Um, when we mentioned earlier the idea of myth building, I think that describing the fact that Philip's head was at Plymouth is something important to say and it wasn't the only one there. And so I think that brings to mind imagery of a reality that can kind of inform and help take away that, that myth building of, of how, how pleasant the pilgrims were. Because 
I don't know, you, you can never know what anyone else feels or thinks, especially throughout time and space, but to imagine walking past something so gruesome every day to accept that, you have to think about that. That was what was going on there. And I think that to put Plymouth into that perspective for, for this audience and also for this audience um, is rather important. Yeah, that's so, yeah. I, I, um, I sometimes, you know, tell, talk to my students about this and, and other graphic things, the burning of the fort, the, the selling of Philip's wife and son into slavery, and, and, and they're like, why did we never learn this? And, you know, this is what APIS has come to address, is, is things that, that, you know, we didn't learn it because we don't want to learn it. We don't want to admit to these things. And when Thanksgiving comes around, you know, we put the, the turkeys and the cornucopias and native and, and pilgrims getting along together. And this is the more accurate image of Plymouth Colony is, is these heads on spikes, perhaps. Um, and I think it's just, just add that, that William Apis himself, he had fought in the War of 1812. He was uh, conscripted, he was, he was below age, he was only 15 years old, and they conscripted him anyways and put him in service, and he fought in some of the worst combat of that war uh, on the side of the United States, and he was aware of the irony of that, but nevertheless, um, as a soldier, he was, uh, I think it was one of the things that he was most proud of, nevertheless, he was a soldier, and it mattered to him how you treat it. You know, he saw people die in combat, and it mattered to him how people were treated and, and how you, you know, what you did with those, those bodies. And, and this was the ultimate dishonor. And, and I think this is, the, this, this is really the emotional highlight of his whole speech. Um, and to, to speak to the way that Philip was dishonored in this, this is the ultimate dishonor that you can pay to a soldier. And, and so it has to be in there, really, to answer your question, I think. Thank you. The discussion of captivity and enslavement of Native peoples during this war is also very prominent in this passage. How do you see this fitting within the broader context of treatment of captives by English and Natives during the colonial period? Well, um, as I was able to describe through Avis's words, um, he talks about Mary Rowlandson and to my memory in reading her narrative, she was able to visit with her children, I believe. And that's a considerable liberty given to a prisoner. Certainly not slavery. Thank you. I think it's um, important also to kind of note the long history of enslavement, um, both um, within the colonies of Native people. Um, it, this didn't start with King Philip's War, and it didn't end with King Philip's War. Um, and again, I think it is really illustrative of the difference in terms of cultural values that apes earlier on talked about how Christianity had destroyed part of the culture. And it really illustrates the differences in the culture that really were caring among the native side of caring for individuals regardless of whether they were native or English, versus the way that colonists who presented themselves as having a better way of living and a better belief system treated others. And I think this is really, really key to kind of think about what does it mean for one um, side of a conflict, people on one side of a conflict, to take good care of their prisoners, and another side of the conflict, tear them to pieces, display them, and sell their children into slavery. 
Yeah, I mean, it just, it proves William Apis's point of who the savages really were, if we want to use that language. Uh, you know, he, he's, it's a theme that runs through the entire eulogy is that native people had a tradition of hospitality that they extended even to prisoners in warfare. And, and he uses, and, 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 and many other ways, you know, he, he uses this throughout his eulogy to, as a, a point of comparison when, when the English came, the, the Wampanoag welcomed them and taught them how to plant and, and you know, those things that we always hear about. Um, and, and, in, and he says, if, if we were to come upon English lands, we would immediately be, be shot and killed. Um, and, and that same kind of hospitality in terms of warfare, the natives treated their, their captives with, uh, with relative kindness under the situa circumstances. Um, and this was something that was not reciprocated by the colonists. Um, so we see he, he offers us a lot of these examples. And then selling um, people into slavery, I think, you know, it's really important to recognize that, that Apis is speaking in the 1830s. And this is a time when uh, abolitionists are, are starting to gain force as a, a movement. And he understands that he's speaking to an abolitionist community, too, and he's, he's saying, this is shameful, and, and maybe this is a point where he can actually reach them, a, a point that actually matters to his audience, that, that they understand that this is a, a concern, but they'd never thought of it in terms that, that Native people were also enslaved, that people after King Philip's War uh, from um, Native communities were enslaved. And he, he throws in there, he doesn't talk about this very often in his writings, but he also mentions that my own people were enslaved because the Pequot War, which took place in the 1630s, um, Pequot people were also uh, enslaved and sold, sold to Bermuda. Um, and so this is a legacy that, that he himself deals with. And when he's talking about slavery and abolition, it's also another thing to remember is that um, William Apis's own mother was, was both, she was enslaved herself. Um, she, was, she was enslaved um, in Connecticut, uh, which still, uh, that slavery was still in existence in Connecticut when William Apis was born, and his mother was enslaved. Um, and so when he speaks about this, it's from personal experience. It's not from uh, something he's talking about abstractly or, or just uh, glomming onto a movement, if you will. This is, this is crucial to his life experience. Thanks again, Brooke. Our next reader will be Anthony Trujillo, a member of the O.K. Owinge Pueblo, one of the six Tewa-speaking Pueblos located in the upper Rio Grande Valley. He's a PhD candidate in American Studies at Harvard University with a Master of Divinity from Yale Divinity School. His research focuses on indigenous engagements with and resistance to colonial Christianities in the 18th and 19th centuries, with particular attention to the effects of Christianity on indigenous connections to their homelands and water spaces and the downstream impacts on territorial, spiritual, and political sovereignties of contemporary Native nations and descendant communities. He is the coordinator of the Native American and Indigenous Studies Working Group at Harvard. Anthony. But who was Philip that made all this display in the world? Who put an enlightened nation to flight and won so many battles? And who did he have to contend with, with all the combined arts of cultivated talents of old and the new world? It was like putting one talent against a thousand. And yet Philip, accomplished more than all of them. Yea, he outdid the well-disciplined forces of Greece under the command of Philip the Grecian 
emperor, for he never, for he never was enabled to lay such plans of allying tribes of the earth together as Philip of Mount Hope did. And even Napoleon patterned after him in collecting his forces and surprising the enemy. Washington, too, pursued many of his plans in attacking the enemy and thereby enabled him to defeat his antagonists and conquer them. What then shall we say? Shall we not do right and say that Philip, with his one talent, outstrips all of them with their 10,000? No warrior of any age was ever known to pursue such plans as Philip did. And as to his benevolence, it was very great. No one in history can accuse Philip of being cruel to his conquered foes. That he, used, that he used them with more hospitality than they the pilgrims did cannot be denied. And that he had knowledge and forethought cannot be denied. How deep then was the thought of Philip when he could look from Maine to Georgia, from the ocean to the lakes, and view with one look all his brethren withering before the more enlightened to come, and how true his prophecy that the white people would not only cut down their groves, but would enslave them. Had the inspiration of Isaiah been there, he could not have been more correct. Our groves and hunting grounds are gone. Our dead are dug up. Our council fires are put out and a foundation was laid in the first legislature to enslave our people by taking from them all their rights, which has been strictly adhered to ever since. Look at all the disgraceful laws Look at the treaties made by Congress all broken. Look at the deep-rooted plans laid when a territory becomes a state that after so many years, the laws shall be extended over the Indians that live within their boundaries. Yea, every charter, every charter that has ever been given was given with the view of driving the Indians out of the states, of dooming them to become chained under desperate laws that would make them drag out a miserable life as one chained to the galley. And this is the course that has been pursued for nearly 200 years. A fire, a canker, created by the pilgrims across the Atlantic to burn and destroy the pilgrim and destroy my poor unfortunate brethren it cannot be denied what then shall we do shall we cease crying and say it is all wrong or shall we bury the hatchet and those unjust laws, and Plymouth Rock together, and become friends? And will the sons of the pilgrims aid us in putting out the fire and destroying the canker that will ruin, that will ruin all their fathers left behind them to destroy? By this, we see how true Philip spoke. As you know, it is a common thing for them to say, Indians cannot live among Christian people. No, even the President of the United States tells the Indians they cannot live among civilized people. And we want your lands and must have them and will have them. As if he had said to them, We want your land for our use to speculate upon. It aids us in paying off our national debts 
and supporting us in Congress to drive you off. You see, my red children, that our fathers carry out, carried on this scheme of getting use for your land, to, to your lands for our use, and that we have now become rich and powerful, and we have a right to do with you just as we please. We claim to be your fathers, and we think we shall do you a great favor, my dear sons and daughters, to drive you out, to get away, to get you out of the way of the reach of our civilized people who are cheating you. For we promised the land you have to someone else long ago, perhaps 20 or 30 years ago, and we did it without your consent, it is true, but this has been the way that our fathers first brought us up, and it is hard to depart from it. Now, while we sum up this subject, it does not appear, does it not appear that all the cause of all the wars from beginning to the end was and is for the want of good usage? That the whites have always been the aggressors and the wars, cruelties, bloodshed is a job of their own seeking and not the Indians? Did you ever know of Indians hurting those who was kind to them? No. We have thousands of witnesses to the contrary. Yea, every male and female declare it to be the fact. We often hear of the wars breaking out upon the frontiers, and it is because of the same spirit, and it is because the same spirit reigns there as reigned here in New England. And wherever there are any Indians, that spirit still reigns. And at present, there is no law to stop it. What then is to be done? Let every friend of the Indian now seize the mantle of liberty, throw it over those burning elements that has spread with such fearful rapidity, and at once extinguish it forever. Let us have principles that will give everyone his due. And then wars will cease, and the weary will find rest. Give the Indians his rights, and you may be assured wars will cease. By this time, you have been able, enabled to see that Philip's prophecy has come to pass. Therefore, as a man of natural abilities, I shall pronounce him the greatest man that ever was in America. And so it, shall, so it will stand until it is proved to the contrary to the everlasting disgrace of the Pilgrim Fathers. Thank you, Anthony. I'm going to pick up on the phraseology that Apes uses and tells his audience that the Indian hunting grounds are gone, our dead are dug up, our council fires extinguished. The laws disenfranchise Indians and treaties made by Congress all broken. For every indigenous person in this room and every ally, these comments resonate today for contemporary indigenous communities of this region and elsewhere. Would you like to expound further on that? It was gonna be a question, but it's a declaration of fact. <laughs> Can I, I'll just say just real quickly and briefly that um, uh, who was imagining anybody was talking that way in 1830s, right? I mean, that's, I guess that's what's so surprising is like that, that it's, it's 1836 and we don't even imagine, it's not part of our cultural imaginary to think that there is a native person who's writing these things and speaking this forcefully and, and in such, like you say, modern terms, right? I mean, he really gets it and, and he's, he's 
you know, he's no longer talking historically. He's talking about what is happening right now to Native people. Um, and and I, I just find it astounding. Yeah, no, I was, as I was thinking about um, that, it was interesting to me to think about the moment where, you know, where it says that every treaty given, and the kind of that word of giving, and that every treaty that has happened in relationship between Native people in the United States has been a taking, that that giving was always a taking, that the, that the Treaty of New Ashota, which was the Cherokee Treaty in 1835, that was most recent, um, was a taking of Cherokee land and actually all, the, you know, dozen, at least dozens of indigenous tribes from uh, east of the Mississippi. So these treaties, and even going back to that first treaty that um, Apis uh, alludes to or talks about in 1620 when the um, Pilgrims land, that it's a taking. Um, and so these treaties are important because they're diplomatic relations, but it's also important to know what's going on, um, that these aren't, that the treaty language kind of glosses over a violent taking. I particularly appreciate in this um, the <laughs> very tongue in cheek, very ironic um, um, way that Apes talks about how the colonists talk about what they're doing in like double speak. And I think that's something that resonates, continues to resonate today. That, that maybe there isn't the same um, taking of land that happened, but there's still that, that, that idea that if we say it's one thing, when it's actually another, that we're gonna like actually be able to kind of get away with it. And so that's where I think there's resonance that continues to today, that there's still, there's, there's still this, I'm gonna tell you I'm doing this thing, but I'm really doing something else, but I really think you want to believe what I'm doing, what I say I'm doing, except as opposed to what I am actually doing. That continues. And that, I think, is, is, is a real, um, I think, cultural issue that has, has um, gone through uh, the, the entire history of our country and that we have to reckon with. Keeping with that theme, Apes declares that whites have always been the aggressors in the wars, cruelties, and bloodshed is a job of their own seeking and not the Indians. How does this contrast with the mythology of perpetual peaceful relations with English colonists? I'll jump in on that and to kind of just it's interesting to me to think about these moments in this portion where uh, Apis asks, what is to be done? Um, I actually think that Apis is casting a decolonial, or anti-colonial at least, vision uh, for what relations could be like that's not based on a mythology, like a kind of reimagining of the past, but an envisioning of the future. Um, so, you know, this quote of the, you know, let the, Friends of the Indians now seize the mantle of liberty. Um, what does that look like? Well, there's, a, there's three, three things that um, Apis calls attention to in, so, like, numerous times throughout this. Um, hunting grounds, you know, they take our, you know, un, unearth our dead, and three, they put out our council, fi council fires. Well, what does a decolonial vision look like? One, indigenous sovereignty, like actually, indigenous people being able to make our own decisions about our communities and having, um, you know, so that aspect, a political status, an expanded political and ex uh, capacious one. Two, you know, we have the security of how we um, make our livings, hunting grounds at this time. I mean, it's all the, all the many ways that 
contemporary Native tribes sustain our communities from casinos to schools to hospitals. We need to be able to do these things um, without opposition because we are independent nations. And I don't think that's, that's quite recognized. Uh, and three, that we should be able to have our, and honor our, our spiritual practices, our ancestors, our dead, um, that are often held actually in places like Harvard and other institutions, um, that this is part of that. And um, so I kind of think that he's casting a vision even as much as he's critiquing the past. I was just, yeah, I think it's, it's a really incredible vision. You know, he, he's asking, what, what shall be done? And I think Anthony's right that he's suggesting all these sort of things, that, you know, in language, because he didn't have that language really available to him that you're using, the language of sovereignty and repatriation, you know, wasn't part of the discourse. And so he's using what is there. But I guess I've always found it really interesting. He talks about Plymouth Rock a lot during this. There were a lot of addresses um, at the time. You know, the, the nation was young and, and people were, were looking at Plymouth Rock as, as like the touchstone of, of American uh, birth and, and, and liberty and all those things. And, and he's saying like, let's bury Plymouth Rock and let's bury the hatchet um, and bury all those things together. And you know that language, burying the hatchet is is sort of like a, I don't know, it, it, it's it's a kind of a, a phrase that, that was appropriated by colonial people to say, Let, let's have a peace treaty. But it actually has its roots in, in Haudenosaunee, um, the foundation of the Haudenosaunee or Iroquois communities where they said, we, we must bury all the weapons of war. Um, and, and that's, that's a, a, a sort of an essential gesture when two parties come together in reconciliation is the first thing that you do is you wipe away the tears from the eyes and the, and the obstructions from the mouth and the throat. And, and you bury the weapons of war so you, can, so you can speak in a peaceful and reasonable manner. And he's saying, he, he's literally, in, in such an interesting rhetorical move, he's suggesting that Plymouth Rock itself is in a way a weapon of war. It's a symbol that represents, that, that is made to cover up all the acts of violence and, and made to represent you know, that shining city on a hill vision perhaps, but he's saying it doesn't mean those things. We have to get past that. If we're going to be friends and allies, we have to bury not just the weapons of war, but the rhetorical devices, the historical weapons of war, things like Plymouth Rock. We need to, we need to bury that with those weapons. So it's a really interesting rhetorical move on his part. You're good? All right. Thank you again, Anthony. It's now my pleasure to introduce our last reader for the evening, Stephanie Mock, a member of the Navajo Nation and curator of North American Ethnographic Collections at the Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology at Harvard University. She has more than a decade of museum professional experience and, and is pursuing a doctorate in museum anthropology at the University of Pennsylvania. Her research focuses on processes of decolonizing museum care practices and their broader implications for both indigenous communities and the transformation of museums. Stephanie. Having now given historical facts and an exposition in relation to ancient times by which we have been enabled to discover the foundation which destroyed our common fathers in their struggle together. It was indeed nothing more than the spirit of avarice and usurpation of power that has brought people in all ages to hate and devour each other. And I cannot for one moment look back upon what is past and call it religion. No, it has not the least appearance like it. Do not then wonder, my dear friends, at my bold and unpolished statements, 
though I do not believe that truth wants any polishing whatever. Oft I have been surprised at the conduct of those who pretend to be Christians, to see how they were affected toward those who were of a different caste, professing one faith. Yes, the spirit of degradation has always been exercised toward us poor and untaught people. If we cannot read, we can see and feel, and we find no excuse in the Bible for Christians conducting toward us as they do. It is said that in the Christian's guide, God is merciful, and they that are his followers are like him. How much mercy do you think has been shown toward Indians, their wives and their children? Not much, we think, no. And ye fathers, I will appeal to you that are white. Have you any regard for your wives and children, for those delicate sons and daughters? Would you like to see them slain and lain in heaps and their bodies devoured by the vultures and wild beasts of prey and their bones bleaching in the sun and air till they molder away or were covered by the falling leaves of the forest and not resist? No, your hearts would break with grief. Our affections for each other are the same as yours. We think as much of ourselves as you do of yourselves. When our children are sick, we do all we can for them. They lie buried deep in our affections. If they die, we remember it long and mourn in after years. Children also cleave to their parents. They look to them for aid. They do the best they know how to do for each other. And when strangers come among us, we use them as well as we know how. We feel honest in whatever we do. We have no desire to offend anyone. But when we are so deceived, it spoils all our confidence in our visitors. In vain I have looked for the Christian to take me by the hand and bid me welcome to his cabin, as my fathers did them before we were born. And if they did, it was only to satisfy curiosity and not to look upon me as a man and a Christian. And so all of my people have been treated, whether Christians or not. I say then, a different course must be pursued, and different laws must be enacted, and all men must operate under one general law. And while you ask yourselves, what do they, the Indians, want? You have only to look at the unjust laws made for them and say, they want what I want. In order to make men of them good and wholesome citizens, and this plan ought to be pursued by all missionaries or not pursued at all. That is, not only to make Christians of us, but men, which plan as yet has never been pursued. And when it is, I will then throw my might upon the side of missions and do what I can to favor it. But this work must begin here, first in New England. Having now closed, I would say that many thanks is due from me to you, though an unworthy speaker for your kind attention. I wish you to understand that we are thankful for every favor, and you and I have to rejoice that we have not to answer for our father's crimes. Neither shall we do right to charge them from one to another. We can only regret it and flee from it and from henceforth let peace and righteousness be written upon our hearts and hands forever is the wish of a poor Indian.
Thank you, Stephanie. When we think about this, the words we've heard this evening, uh, the, the closing of this, despite all of his sharp rebukes and harsh critiques, Apes concludes with an expression of hope and humility. He calls for peace and righteousness to be written upon our hearts and hands forever is the wish of a poor Indian. From your perspectives, why does he choose to conclude this way? What other way is there? Um, I think it's also illustrative of the underlying values that exist within Native communities. That um, there is this sense of us all being connected and all related, um, both um, people and everything else here. And so how can you not think about bringing things together um, if you want things to get better? Because if the, the alternative is to keep going the way we've been going. And so this is, I think, his exhortation to his audience to Think about doing things differently. Thank you. Um, yeah, I guess if you're going to stand up and criticize people for two hours about how horrible you've been for 400 years, <laughs> you better have a different <laughs> solution in mind. And, you know, he is, he's a reverend, he's a minister, uh, he's a, he's a, he's been a practicing Methodist, and, and he's, he believes in peace. I think this is, this is the message he has come to speak of, and, and he believes in it not just as, you know, not just from the perspective that, you know, it, it's his Christian, I guess it's, it's, it's the fact that he's a myth, myth, minister that, that sort of gives him the uh, ability to stand up on this podium and, and critique people from that position of Christianity, but like Elizabeth saying, this is also a deeply held indigenous belief, right? This, this, this idea that of, of rooted in, in peaceful relations. And, and so I think this, this is his message. Yeah, I, mean, I completely agree with both of you. And in the face of settler colonialism, you have to envision a different future. And that's what he's, he's calling for here. Um, and to do otherwise is to be hopeless. So he has to end that way. Thank you. This concludes the reading portion. I'm going to ask all of our readers to stand up, give them another great round of applause. And our esteemed panelists. And I want to thank you all for coming here. And I have five minutes to wrap up, which I am not going to take because we're still supposed to have a reception and a chance to interact and engage with one another and also a very brief period of time now for questions and answers from the audience. What I have heard and what you have heard from the writings of Reverend Apes 160, 70 years ago? 187. 187 years ago now. My math is correct, I'm an English major. So. Still pertinent, still relevant. Calling in the 1830s. Reverend Apes is a truth teller. Before there can be healing, there first must be truth. He's calling out based on ancient indigenous traditions of condolence ceremonies native to this place, to this region, to Eastern native peoples. He is calling out 
and acknowledging the pain that has happened for indigenous communities, loss of land, loss of ancestors, loss of children, loss of family, erasure, a lack of recognition. The real Indians are down there in Georgia. Nothing to see here, folks. Whatever's happening to the Mashpee, which caused the Mashpee revolt, that's an illusion. This is what's really happening. Pay attention to this. Misdirection. He calls this out. He challenges the abolitionists here to listen to their better angels. He uses his rhetorical training as a minister to both challenge, to indict, and also to offer the hope of reconciliation. To offer the hope of a change in relationship from occupiers to neighbors. And the question for all of us, hearing this work, hearing his words read in this place tonight, is to be inspired by them, to remember them, and to act on them. How can we use this which is based in the quote-unquote revolt of the 1830s to move it forward to talk about indigenous resistance, resilience, and resurgence. Moving together as neighbors here on this shared place, which should be sacred to all of us as it sustains us. Thank you again for being here. Now I'm going to have five minutes for a couple of questions from the audience. And questions, please. It was wonderful. Thank you very, very much. Um, two questions. One is, where did he preach? Where, did, where was his church? And how was it received? Excellent questions. I'm sorry, where did he preach, did you ask? Mm -hmm. and, and what was the second half? How was it received? Oh, how was it received? <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I've written a, a biography of William Apis, and, and I try to understand these, these details of his life. And what I was always amazed about was he covered a lot of ground. I mean, so much ground. And, and like, I don't even, you know, he... he Maybe he had a donkey. He never mentions it. I think he's just walking most of the time. Um, but he preached all the way from... Uh, we, I, I, I followed through newspaper um, advertisements. He, he preached in Georgetown, Virginia, all the way up to Bangor, Maine. Um, he, he, he got around. He had, he, had, he had a kind of route that he ran. He, he, had a, he was a circuit minister for a while with the Methodist organization, and that took him all the way out to... Uh, Troy, New York, um, and and all throughout New England, but he got around. And how it was received is tricky. Um, his very first sermon, people threw things at him. Uh, you know, as, as and and he he questioned their Christianity there as well. But um, they 19th century audiences were tough, from what we understand. It, it was pretty common to throw things at people if if you didn't like them and 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 boo and hiss. So I imagine he got some of that, but he was also, he was, um, I, I don't want to go too long because I know we don't have a lot of time, but, but he was also, he was received harshly. People, people in the newspapers, when he arrived in a certain place, they would call him an imposter. Um, they would slander him. He was, uh, it, people broke into his home and beat him within an inch of his life because he was a, an outsider who was trying to rile up the local, you know, their Indians. Um, and so I, I think it's really important for people to know just how much courage it took for him to, to just get back up and keep doing it, because he did. He, kept back, he got back up and he kept doing it. Uh, and he was also imprisoned multiple times yeah. as a result of his advocacy on behalf of the Mashpee. And he also gave two standing room only orations at the Odeon Theater, which was around the corner from here. So both of these things are true. Yeah, he filled up, he filled up halls. Um, he got thrown in jail for doing it sometimes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. One more question, yes. Uh, 
wondering, oh, thank you. Um, when he called out the monstrosity of slavery in his uh, eulogy, um, what was his engagement with the abolition of slavery for enslaved black people in Boston? And you know, there was a lot of intermarriage between black and native peoples. The communities in Boston were very um, intertwined. I'm just wondering, you know, was he in conversation with black abolitionists, and what, you know, what was his involvement, if if any, in that? True. Sure. Um, he he was. Um, it, so it's 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 hard to parse all of that, but he he was involved in the ab abolitionist movement here in Boston. Um, William Lloyd Garrison, who some people might know, was the sort of the white leader of the abolitionist movement here. He was the editor of The Liberator, um, which Frederick Douglass wrote for um, in later years. And, and Garrison had a church, a meeting house in Boston. I, I think it was on Federal Street. I can't remember which one it was. But William Apis was not only an invited speaker there, he was like the speaker, he was the preacher in residence for the whole summer, I think, of 1832, I believe. And, and so he was really deeply involved in it, and, and Garrison would, would pick up William Apis's cause um, and advertise it in the newspaper, um, things that he did. And so, uh, you know, I wish I could say more to it than that. Like, you could see beyond it, but, but I, I don't, we don't have a lot of written evidence of what he, how he was involved in it, but just from the fact that he had that connection and was clearly um, valued by that community that, that they gave him that speaking post in their church for a whole summer shows that, that he was speaking to that community in ways that they, um, that they valued, yeah. Thank you again. We appreciate you all for being here and thank you all to the readers, fellow panelists. It's been a, an honor and a privilege and thank you for making this opportunity available and let's please uh, enjoy the reception before the building closes down. <laughs>